Hello everybody, my name is Keith Schwarz, I'm a senior lecturer at Stanford University, and today I would like to present to you an assignment I have been using for many years in my CS2 course. I've entitled that assignment, Recursion to the Rescue. So what is this assignment? At a high level, this assignment consists of three smaller recursive backtracking problems that are all independent of one another. What unifies them is a common theme, and that theme is to get students solving problems with stakes. By that, I want students to be writing code that takes on questions that they are interested in answering independently of what they're learning in their computer science course. I want them to be taking on questions that are intrinsically interesting to them. By then showing them that recursive backtracking is a tool they can use to solve those problems, I want to encourage students to push through the difficulty, to build something they're proud of, and at the very end to feel this sense of empowerment. I can ask questions about the world that's interesting to me, and I can get answers to them using computers. All three parts of this assignment could in principle be split apart into three separate assignments. It could be remixed with other components. We have historically bundled them together, and so I'd like to present all of them to you right now. Again, keep in mind, you could in principle use any one of these in isolation. The first question we have people work on is the disaster planning problem, which can be stated as follows. Imagine that you have a transportation grid for a country, or at least part of a country. Here I have a transportation grid for the Western United States. That's you up over there, you're in Portland. I'm recording this video near Stanford campus, which is somewhere around San Francisco, and over on the far right side, you can see Las Vegas. The goal is to go and, and put emergency supplies into these different cities to stockpile in the event of a natural disaster. Now, it would be very expensive to have every single city provide all of its own emergency supplies, so we agree on the following compromise. Every city either needs to have emergency supplies or be immediately adjacent to a city that does. The question then comes up, how few cities can you stockpile supplies in so that every city is ready? Every city either has emergency supplies or is immediately adjacent to a city that does. Now that's a problem that many students would want to solve independently of the fact that this is a computer science exercise and we're having them use recursive backtracking. It's also a very challenging problem to solve. If you take a look at this transportation grid and think how few cities do you need to cover, it would be tricky to come up with something where you are sure you have the right answer. But once students write the right backtracking algorithm, after a little bit of effort, the computer can happily report that the minimum number of cities you need is five. Here's one possible way to do this. The gold indicates that a city has supplies. So for example, Sacramento is storing emergency supplies and cities in blue are being covered by other cities. Portland doesn't have emergency supplies, but it's adjacent to Sacramento, which does. To give you a sense of how hard this problem can be to do by hand, let me show you some other transportation grids. For example, here's a transportation grid that's modeled after southern Nigeria. It is very difficult to eyeball this and determine how many cities you need to place supplies in to cover everything, but with the computer search, after a matter of seconds, it'll spit out this answer, which has only eight cities and yet supplies every single city here. Take a second to take a look at this. Look at every blue city. You can find some gold city, some city that has supplies immediately adjacent to it. One more example, here's a map that is a rough approximation of the rail networks of Central Europe. Again, very difficult to figure out where to put supplies, but the computer has no trouble identifying these six cities as the optimal answer. So what makes this assignment interesting for students? I think part of it is that the question that is being solved, please cover every city in the event of a disaster, is something students are interested in. It's a very simple problem to state, and it's very difficult to solve by hand, even with the transportation grid in front of you. So students are intrinsically motivated. How do I come up with the answer to this? What is the answer? And they see recursion as a technique for doing so. On a more personal level, if you pick the right transportation grids, if you choose transportation grids that are representative of where your students are from, students appreciate seeing their hometown showing up on this list. We have maps from many different places on the earth. It's very easy to add your own. Additionally, this problem is interesting algorithmically. You might be tempted to solve this problem by enumerating for example, every combination of K cities for different values of K and check to see if each one of them works. Technically that'll work, but it won't terminate anytime soon. So in the handout, we suggest an alternative strategy that is based on picking a city and then trying all possible ways of covering just that city. That turns out to be fast enough to solve uh, these problems with up to 40 cities in up to in under a minute. Additionally, the payoff for this is just visually interesting. All of the images you've seen are taken directly from the starter files. When you get this thing working, it is just fun to flip through all the maps, hit the button, and have the recursion do its work. So that's the first question we have students do, disaster planning. 
The second one we've given the title Doctors Without Orders. To explain what this problem is, I wanted to show you the setup. It's quite simple. You have a hospital. It has some number of doctors, and each of those doctors has only a certain number of hours they can work each day. You have a number of patients that need to be seen, and each patient needs to be seen for a certain number of hours. So here's your question. Can every patient be seen? And if so, how should the doctors do this? This is again a problem that is fairly easy to state. Every patient needs to be seen. Doctors have time limits, figure it out. And yet it's actually somewhat difficult to solve these problems as soon as the number of doctors or patients grows to any reasonable level. But with a recursive backtracking search, the computer has little trouble identifying when solutions exist. And in this case comes up with this one right over here. So what makes this problem interesting for students? It touches on healthcare and it touches on resource allocation, which are two things that many students are concerned about. They see the price of healthcare going up and they wonder, what can I do about it? Well, maybe making better use of the resources we have would be a good first step. It's also a problem where you can look at it and say, this is fairly difficult to do by hand, but it is not that difficult once the computer takes over. That motivates students to get the recursion to work, to think through the problem and see how to get the computer to solve it. It also has an algorithmic comp uh, component to it that is interesting for students to explore. One way you can solve this problem is going one doctor at a time, assigning them a set of patients. Another option is to go one patient at a time, deciding which doctor is going to see them. One of these strategies is much easier than others, and it's interesting for students to explore this and discover that on their own. And again, as before, the visual payoff is quite nice. It is very fun to flip through the different demo files and see what they look like. The last problem we have students do we call winning the presidency, which you might recognize as an applied version of the knapsack problem. This is motivated by a story that I read on NPR in 2016, right before the election, that said that the way the Electoral College was set up, you could actually win 23% of the popular vote in the US and still become elected president. This analysis was based off of data that they got from the 2012 election. There was a note in this article which I found interesting, which is someone had written in and said, when you wrote this article initially, you said 27%, here's a better strategy that does 23%. Turns out neither of these numbers are optimal. You actually could do it with 21.1% of the popular vote. The way you do it is by winning the states that are highlighted here in gold. I'm not sure what coalition you would do that would actually give this to you. You're winning basically the entire Western United States except for Washington and Colorado. But in principle, if you want a majority of the popular vote, the most narrow majority possible in each one of those states, you would end up with a majority of the electoral votes in the Electoral College. Congratulations, you're sitting behind the Resolute Desk. We have data going back to 1828, and so we can look at other elections. Here's 1984, what you would need to win. You can see that now you're not winning California anymore. You're now seeming to win most of the states in the central United States. Here's what it would look like in 2000. And we can have the data going back even further if you'd be interested in seeing that. All of these plots here are generated by the assignment starter files themselves. Now, what's so interesting about this is that this is a classic problem. This is the knapsack problem. Every state has a weight, which is how many votes you need in order to carry the electors, and it has a value, the number of electors. And the question is how much value you can carry if you have a limited amount of weight. We don't tell that to students, though, because they're already focused on the political aspect of this. They hear about the Electoral College. We have an election coming up right now. They wonder about what FAIR is. And this gives them the tools to start asking questions like this. Again, this problem is quite difficult to solve by hand. I know this because NPR got it wrong twice. It also allows you to explore trends in US history. You can see states being added to the union. You can see populations shifting around as which states build your winning coalition shift over time. And algorithmically, this is a great way to motivate why dynamic programming or memoization are important. If you don't use those techniques, you do not get answers back to these questions. With these techniques in place, the com answers come back almost immediately. And again, same as before, the visual payoff is huge. It is very fun to take the starter program and drag that slider bar around at the bottom to change which year is displayed. In doing that, you can see all these states being added, states joining coalitions, states leaving coalitions. It's exciting. So what materials do we have available? We use C++ in our intro programming class, and we use Qt for the graphics. If you would like to use this assignment as is, the starter files will be up on the Nifty website. The starter files contain all the visualizers that you've seen over here, as well as an automated test suite that we give to students. It also includes a set of auto grader tests that we use when we're trying to grade students' submissions. But again, once you have the idea to do this, it's really a question of getting the right data files and building the right visualizers, and I'm sure that could easily be done in Python or JavaScript or whatever language you're using. Thank you so much for your time. Hope you enjoy the rest of your stay in Portland and have a great day.